Good morning. We are in this series called Anothering as we are striving to do what we should do better than anyone else in the world. The leverage we have that is our greatest, our capacity to love other people the way that Jesus has loved us. So I saw on the internet recently something that every father of a daughter can appreciate. An application for permission to date my daughter form. And it, and it has what I think are some great questions that every dad would want to know about any prospective date for his daughter. It starts with simple questions like name, date of birth, height, weight, IQ, GPA. And then it goes to a few questions like the church you attend and how often. And then two short essay questions in 50 words or less. Explain what don't touch my daughter means to you. And in 50 words or less, explain what late means to you. And then a couple fill in the blank sentences. If I were to be shot, the last place I would want to be shot is in the and then you fill in the blank. And if I were to be beaten, the last bone that I would want broken is, and you fill in the blank. And then the one thing I hope this application does not ask is, and you fill in the blank. Then a, a few other simple questions like, have you ever been fingerprinted? Do you have any tattoos? Where are they located? And then sign your name. And I like at the bottom, it says, thank you for your interest. Please allow four to six years for processing. Because accepting new or different people does not come easily to the flesh. It is one of the greatest challenges faced by those of us who want to improve in our anothering. And we do want to improve, first, because we are under orders. We have a master, a Lord, who gave us the command, not just the golden rule, but the platinum rule, that we should love one another as he loved us. So we do this because we are under orders, but more than just that, we do this because we love Jesus. We really love Jesus. We really do believe that he is the best example of what a life should look like. And we want to be more like him. So we are intentional at this business of trying to improve our anothering. And it is one of our opportunities to let his church shine. And we talk a lot about how we've got to walk the walk. And, and that's so true. But in the business of anothering, we've also got to talk the talk, especially when it comes to to acceptance speech, because few speeches are harder to write and harder to do right, because there is a tension. And the tension that we live with is this. How do we, as anotherers, balance living with conviction and loving without conditions? You see, we don't want acceptance to slip into unacceptable compromise. And we hear about churches that have done that, churches that have diminished the authority of Scripture, churches that have discounted the deity and the supremacy of Christ, churches that have allowed what Scripture calls unallowable immorality. We don't want to cross that line under the banner of acceptance. But here's the truth. Most church plants actually were really church splits. And most church splits were not over compromise of core biblical doctrines, but were instead fights about peripheral matters of opinion and interpretation. But we... We must be honest that what might just be a matter of opinion to me could be a matter of deep personal faith to you. 
And this is true because we don't always appreciate how much culture has affected the way that we read Scripture. It always has. So in the first century, for example, you have a church in Rome and you've got great diversity in that church, particularly ethnic diversity, Jew and Gentile worshiping together. And this was a first in the history of the world. And you're going to have some deeply held convictions, but not held by all. You've got a Jewish Christian that has always kept the Sabbath. Now, he has accepted Jesus as his Messiah. Does that make him less of a Jew? No, it made him more of a Jew. He is a fulfilled Jew. Is he going to stop keeping the Sabbath? That, to him, would seem not just disrespectful, but dishonoring to God. But this Gentile Christian has never kept the Sabbath. He doesn't get the Sabbath. And he's not about to start trying. Now, does this Jewish Christian, how does he love without conditions that Gentile Christian who does not hold what is a deeply held conviction for him? As a Gentile, for years... You took meat to that idol. You would place it before that block of stone because it wasn't a block of stone to you. It was a place where you met with the God to whom you had given allegiance, the God that you were trying to appease. Now, the Jew always thought that was just a block of stone. There's no God there. And he never had a problem going to the store and buying that hunk of meat that you just prayed over. He would take it home and he would cook it. But the Gentile cannot understand how in the world you could take that meat that people believe they were giving to a God and then treat it like a steak. So how is he supposed to love without conditions this Jew who does not honor his deeply held convictions. Do you see how the culture in which you were raised can deeply impact the way you see certain things in Scripture? Some churches here in the Midwest preach against what they call mixed swimming. I grew up in Florida. I had never heard of such a thing until I came up north. Our youth groups would go to the beach together for devotionals. I, I think that a church's stand on mixed swimming was directly proportional to how close that church was either to the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. You see, culture has always been a, a lens through which we try to read Scripture. Now, typically, our history has been in these situations that we just part ways. And I find it significant that Paul does not counsel that people just meet in divided communities. He does not say, some of you, you meet over here and put a sign up that says church meets here and have a picture of a big slab of meat on the sign. And then the other, you, you meet over there and you have a sign that shows a slab of meat with a, with a line through it. Instead, this is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. In other words, do not view relationships as disposable, even when we don't always agree. But it's not easy. It's not easy to love without conditions. People who do not hold some of my deeply held convictions. It's hard to not love them without conditions. 
In a sense, the whole book of Romans is one long acceptance speech. So in the first eight chapters, Paul basically reminds the church of that common salvation of grace through faith that they all share. In chapter one, he says, you Gentiles are steeped in sin, totally depraved and very far from God. But then in chapter two, he says, you Jews, even though you had the law, you are no better because you didn't keep the law that you had. In chapter 3, he said, all are unrighteous. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in the next five chapters, he says, un, he says that righteousness has been credited to all of us in the exact same way, by grace, through faith, as we have trusted in the offering of Jesus as the perfect atoning sacrifice. So all of us have received salvation the same way, no matter who we are, what our culture was, or what we think. Then in the second half of the book, he says, so let's get practical. How are you going to live together? You are going to live together by striving for peace, by stressing unity, by walking in the Holy Spirit, and by not forcing your personal convictions onto your brothers or sisters. And he concludes in chapter 15 with these powerful words that, that we're going to just park on for a little bit. Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. Now, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Now, another verse picked up quickly that there were two another moments in that text. The first one is be of the same mind with one another. Now, do not interpret be of the same mind with think alike, because Paul has already said that you all don't think alike. You, you see, it is naive to assume that if we just all read the Bible honestly, we would all reach the same conclusions. I remember being confronted once by an individual about a a zombie TV show that I enjoy watching. I was told by the person in no uncertain terms that they were literally considering leaving the church over the knowledge that their pastor watched a TV show like that. They told me they didn't want their kids to know that their pastor watched those kinds of things. Well, the next day, I spoke with the person, I waited, because it isn't always best to respond immediately in the heat of things. I had been in this person's home on multiple occasions, and I had seen the big video collection that they had on their wall. They had movies and, and TV shows that, that they own that I would not necessarily watch. I just, I just asked them about one of their videos. I asked them if they had watched that television show with their children yet, and they agreed. Maybe they had been a bit harsh with me about watching a TV show about zombies. We, we all don't necessarily come to the same conclusions about different issues of opinion. Good, noble people can read the Bible sincerely and not always reach the same conclusions. Paul has already allowed for differing opinions, even as he pleads for the same mind. Because to have the same mind with one another doesn't mean that we all think alike. It means we all agree on the ultimate win. One of the greats in the NBA was Larry Bird, the Hall of Famer from the Boston Celtics. His coach was Casey Jones. One particular game, it's toward the end, the game is close, and a timeout is called. 
Casey Jones has his team around him and he is diagramming a, a play to run when Larry Bird says in a loud voice, just get me the ball and everyone else get out of my way. And with a stern voice, Casey Jones looked at Larry and said, I am the coach of this team and I will call the plays. Then he turned back to the huddle and he said, get Larry the ball and everyone else get out of the way. You see, they all agreed on the win. And people with different convictions can love without conditions if we all agree to pursue the mind of Christ. And we can have the same mind even if we don't have the same opinions. And we don't have to wonder what the mind of Christ is because Scripture actually lays that out for us. Paul writes in Philippians 2, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, unity does not require total agreement. It requires a total commitment to consider others ahead of yourself. In other words, do not always think the same, but they think alike because they try to think like Jesus. Be of the same mind with one another and accept one another. And here Paul says something I, I never noticed for years. It is very important. Two times in chapter 14, Paul sides with the Jewish Christians on the meat Question. He said in verse 20, everything is indeed clean. And if you're concerned that some food is not clean because it had been sacrificed to an idol, you are wrong. But he is completely willing to accept those he thinks are wrong without trying to change their mind because he knows that love is always right. Anothering means accepting without fixing. Get that. You don't have to fix first, then accept. When Shannon and I were married, I began celebrating Thanksgiving and Christmas with her family. And by the way, where you go for Christmas or Thanksgiving will probably be the source of your first fight as a newlywed. And guys, let me tell you how that's going to go. As I said, I began celebrating Thanksgiving and Christmas with my wife's family. Now, in my family, Thanksgiving and Christmas was always held at my grandma's house, and she did most of the cooking, and the whole family would just literally be all throughout the house with a plate on their lap eating copious amounts of food. At Christmas, all the presents were stacked under the tree, and when we got back from the Christmas Eve service at church, we would all dive in and open our presents, and it would all be over in about 10 minutes. At Shannon's home, they don't do it that way. And so that night at her parents' home, she and I had what I would call an unscheduled discussion that was probably precipitated by my statement, your family doesn't do Christmas right. Now what we both had to learn is that her family does not do Christmas wrong. And my family does not do Christmas wrong. And neither family needed to be fixed. Get this. Different doesn't always mean wrong. And wrong doesn't necessarily always mean change. God reserves the right to use people who are sometimes wrong. In fact, if you think about it, he has no other choice. And in other words, give up their right to always have to be right. They excel 
at acceptance speech. Well, what does that sound like? Well, let's get very specific. First, write this down. In other words, speak about the gospel and its implications. Anothering is deeply rooted in the radical message of the cross. Look again with me at verse 7, Romans 15, verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What conditions did you have to meet before Christ was willing to die for you? H.A. Ironside tells a story about a man named Bishop Potter that was on a transatlantic cruise. He went down into his room where he met the fellow that he would be going across the Atlantic sharing a cabin with. Sometime later, he found the ship's purser and he said, I don't usually avail myself of this privilege, but may I keep my watch and my valuables in the ship's safe? I'm not sure that my roommate is a man of trustworthy character. To which the purser replied, that would be fine, Bishop. In fact, your roommate saw me earlier and made the same request because he's concerned about you. Now here's the reality. The gospel reminds us of our common, desperate need for grace. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, you need grace. It doesn't matter what political party you support, you need grace. And people who understand their desperate need for grace are profoundly impacted in the way they treat other people. You see, if I understand that I desperately need grace, then if there is an area where I deem myself free, but you actually feel bound, an area that I deem conservative or traditional, my desperate need for grace will keep me from ever looking down on you and having a condescending or arrogant attitude toward you. I need grace too much for that. And if there is an area where you are free, but I am not, where I feel bound by a conviction that you do not have, my desperate need for grace will keep me from questioning your motives. Just because you don't honor the conviction that I keep does not mean we cannot another each other. And hear me clearly again. I am not speaking of unacceptable compromise of biblical doctrine or issues of morality that are clearly laid out in the Word of God. Acceptance speech is grounded in the gospel because we remember this simple truth. Jesus died for people, not for points of view. So we speak the gospel and its implications because God's praise is our ultimate preference. One right, another words, never yield, is the right to give glory to God. Again, look at verse 7 from Romans 15. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. God is praised. God is honored in the eyes of the world when the world sees in the church what it cannot find anywhere else. And what it sees is not sameness. It sees a united people, not because we all think alike, but because our allegiance to Christ has transcended all of our differences. He ever really pondered the words of the old hymn, the old rugged cross? We sing it, and honestly, it's, it's just another hymn to me most of the time. But have you really considered those words? I will cherish the old rugged cross. I will lay down my trophies. Friend, has it dawned on you how cosmic this thing that God was doing in Jesus is? It is so big. Through the cross, He is bringing the whole world together. Our differences are big, but our God is so much bigger. And that is always the main point of acceptance speech. Our God is bigger than 
anything between us. And the world notices that. So we speak, except when it is more loving to say nothing. Sometimes, and I want you to listen close, sometimes the best way to lift up Christ is to drop the subject. The best thing some of you could do in your relationships is to just let it go. Because the relationship is more important than who is right. Look at verse, the first part of verse 22 in Romans 14. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. He's talking about your personal faith convictions on issues that are not salvation issues of the faith. Sometimes silence really is golden. And sometimes love is best heard because you stop talking. I heard a story from a man who had one of his last visits with his mother before she died of cancer. His mother attended a church in town of many churches that some would call very, very conservative. A church that not only viewed other churches with ill, but often spoke disparagingly of all of the other churches in town. But when she started down the long cancer road, the family began to see word, receive words and cards and flowers and notes and acts of kindness and deeds of service from the people at those very churches they had disdained. And her son was there during one of those visits. And when the couple left, his mother turned to him and said, you know, we've never had a close relationship with those people we haven't agreed with them on a lot of things, but they really have showed love to me. And, and when you're dying, the difference over those issues just doesn't seem to matter. And with gentle wisdom, he said to his mother, Mom, we are all dying. So when and why do they ever matter? She turned to her husband and she said, you know, we've really wasted a lot of time. And listen, I do not want that to be your thought in your last days because we're all terminal. We all have only so many more days in these mortal bodies. Don't waste any refusing to another. I want to pray with you this morning. Would you stand up?